It would appear the sun has set on yet another corner of the British Empire. This one far down in the South Atlantic. Argentina today invaded and seized the Falkland Islands, which have been under British rule for nearly 150 years. Britain promptly broke diplomatic relations with Argentina, sent several of Her Majesty's warships steaming south, and appealed to the United Nations. There is mounting evidence that the Argentine armed forces are preparing to invade the Falkland Islands. In the early hours of April the 2nd, 1982, the cacophony of war rang out in the streets of Port Stanley. A small but brave force of Royal Marines and civilian volunteers would stare down Argentinian invasion, surrender and come back as liberators. Thatcher's government would go from defeat to victory, retain their stranglehold on British politics until the early 90s, and the British public would make heroes of Task Force South. Before the history of that war would be written, the battle for Government House was set to take place. In this video, we will look closer at this often overlooked first phase of the Falklands War. But before we begin, please don't forget to subscribe and leave a like on this video, it really helps the channel grow. Thank you. The Argentinian invasion plan, codenamed Operation Rosario, was set to take place in the early hours of the 2nd of April 1982. Task Force 40 would seek to oust the Royal Marine Detachment from Port Stanley. It consisted of the Cabo San Antonio and the Isla de los Estados, which between them carried a force of over 900 troops of the 2nd Marine Infantry Battalion, along with a Type 42 destroyer the Santis Trinidad, which was to land amphibious commandos onto the island preceding the main assault. As well as troops, Task Force 40 also possessed Amtraks. This initial invasion force was commanded by Rear Admiral Carlos Busa. His force drastically outnumbered and outgunned the Falklands Islands Defence Forces. Facing down the invaders would be Naval Party 8901, made up of Major Mike Norman's 57 Royal Marines with 11 sailors also under his command. Norman's force was also supported by members of the local militia, the FDIF, made up of civilian volunteers and ex-marines who had come to live on the island. The Royal Marines were equipped with typical British infantry small arms of the day, including Sterling submachine guns, SLRs and GPMGs. They could also bring to bear 66mm Law anti-tank rocket launchers and 88mm Carl Gustav recoilless rifles. They did not, however, have any armoured support of their own. Interestingly, the FDIF had the use of a Vickers gun, a remnant from the days of trench warfare. Unfortunately, 303 would not buzz through the skies of Port Stanley during the coming battle. Governor Rex Hunt was acting as Commander-in-Chief of the British and Falkland forces on the island. He had hoped that bloodshed could be avoided and diplomacy would win the day. But this would not come to pass. He addressed the people of the islands on the 1st of April 1982, declaring a state of emergency. Under these emergency powers, I can detain any person, authorise the entering of any premises, acquire any property, and issue such orders as I see fit. Now, I have no further news about the Argentine Navy Task Force, but may I just say that the morale of the Royal Marines and the FIDF is terrific, and it makes me proud to be their Commander-in-Chief. Writing in a 2018 memoir of his experiences of the Falklands, Major Norman writes, The Governor showed me a signal from London, headed Argentine Action Against the Falklands Islands. It read, We now have apparently reliable evidence that an Argentine task force will gather off Cape Pembroke early tomorrow morning, 2nd April. Rex said to me, What do you think of that? We've called their bluff for nearly 20 years, and now it looks like you and I are the poor buggers who are going to be on the receiving end. Assembling his force in the Moody Brook Barracks at 11pm on the 1st of April for a final briefing, it was here he delivered a speech to rally his men, a scene reminiscent of Richard Lunsdale's address in Oosterbeek Church in 1944. Norman recollects, It was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life, to try and give convincing orders to men whom I know had no chance of winning, and who were very likely going to die. They knew that too, they were not fools, and I was convinced that most of us would surely die. 
Argentine commandos had snuck onto the island in Gemini assault craft and had slipped in behind the beaches that Major Norman had thought the main assault would come from. At 6.05am, 2nd of April 1982, explosions erupted and traitor fire tore through the early morning sky. The Argentine troops poured small arms fire and lob grenades onto the now deserted Moody barracks. They soon realised the building was deserted and a section moved in towards Government House. A fierce gun battle ensued with 40 Argentine Special Forces troopers forcing their way towards the Marines' positions, hurling stun grenades as they went. The crack of SLRs filled the air. I couldn't believe the amount of fire they were putting in, said Corporal Geordie Gill. Parts of the building were completely wrecked and all the windows were shot out. They were obviously a snatch squad. The Argentines silenced some machine guns made them hard to locate in the darkness. The encounter between Norman's Royal Marines and the Argentine commandos led to one of the more obscure small arms engagements in military history. I will now hand over to my friend Matt at the armourer's bench, who will elaborate further. This is a Sterling Mark IV, better known in British service as the L2A3. It's an open bolt submachine gun and is part of a generation of submachine guns which emerged during the early years of the Cold War. It was developed by George Patchett during the latter half of World War II and entered British service in 1954. It was also widely exported. By the time of the Falklands War, the Stirling had already been in service for 30 years. The Argentine invasion and the Battle of Government House is unique in that it is one of a handful of occasions when Stirlings were present on both sides. We know that the Royal Marines of Naval Party 8901 defending Government House along with the section of naval hydrographers from HMS Endurance, had a number of sterlings along with their SLRs and assorted weapons. From contemporary photographs, we know that the Argentine commandos that attacked Government House were armed with a mix of Mark IV and suppressed Mark V sterlings, although the exact number is unknown. Here's a clip of the Mark V in action. The Mark V has an integral suppressor, which dampens the sound of the gun firing. An ideal weapon for a snatch squad, hoping to sneak in and capture the island's governor. The gun's designer, George Patchett, began work on the Mark V in 1959, and the British military adopted it as the L-34A1 in 1967. Like the Mark IV, the suppressed Mark V was also widely exported. One incident during the battle stands out. During a lull in the fighting, Major Gary Newt was checking Royal Marine defensive positions when he heard Spanish voices above him. Three members of the Argentine commandos had managed to infiltrate Government House during the first skirmish and had remained hidden during the early hours of the morning. Major Newt decided to oust the Argentine commandos. This scene was recreated in the 1992 film An Ungentlemanly Act. There are several accounts of the event, one depicted in the film shows Newt firing into the ceiling, while another account differs slightly, stating that Newt went to fire into the ceiling, but when he pulled the trigger, there was only a single bang. He had not pushed the selector lever all the way forward to the fully automatic position. Another Royal Marine, realising his mistake, quickly fired a burst from his own sterling before Newt joined in. Regardless of the exact course of events, the fire from the sterlings caused the hidden Argentine commandos hurry downstairs and surrender. Sterlings were used throughout the rest of the war, being used in a number of medal winning actions, including Lieutenant Colonel Herbert H. Jones, who was awarded the posthumous Victoria Cross for his actions during the Battle of Goose Green, and Royal Navy Lieutenant Commander John Murray Sefton, who was awarded a posthumous Distinguished Service Cross for directing anti-aircraft fire aboard HMS Ardent. Sefton was killed by an Argentine bomb while reportedly firing his sterling at a low-flying Argentine Skyhawk as it flew overhead. As mentioned by Matt, the battle was depicted in the 1992 film An Ungentlemanly Act, directed by Stuart Urban. I recently had the chance to speak to Stuart on the Fighting on Film podcast, and he had this to say on the filming of the scenes that depict the attack on Government House. Uh, I was playing a commando and hadn't done the military training because there wasn't time. Um, that was my excuse, uh, unlike a lot of the cast. And 
I therefore had forgotten in this w terrible Falklands wind squall and rainstorm and shooting up on the ridge above Government House that I hadn't got the uh, safety catch on and I slipped on the rock and let uh, around into the face of my cameraman and I thought I'd blinded him uh, the blank round which you know of course can harm people with metal. I was very lucky it didn't happen um, but it, it was it really felt like you were in the role when mm. you were looking down at government house and they were firing all these thousands of rounds were fired in that in that battle by the way in the fake battle mm. for more from that exclusive episode you can find a link to the podcast in the description below by 6 35 a.m argentine amtrak started to appear on the islands being spotted by royal marine lookouts to the west of york point they started to move in towards port stanley with one amtrak being knocked out by a royal marine law anti-tank launcher as the morning rolled on, the Amtrak to Argentine Marines deployed. Major Norman's men continued to put up a stiff resistance. Gun battles continued to ring out in the streets surrounding the government house. However, Argentine Hercules transport planes were delivering more fresh troops and supplies into the island. DQMS Bill Aspinall said, Suddenly, I could hear the sound of engines to our left. It was the Argentinians. More and more Amtraks were coming down the road behind us. We were stuffed. Assessing his options with Commander-in-Chief Rex Hunt, Major Norman proposed three courses of action. One, evacuate Rex, fight a guerrilla war in the wilderness. Two, remain at Government House, fight out until the bitter end. Or option three, which was to organise a truce with the Argentine commander. Rex chose the third option. It was 9.25am in the morning. The battle for Stanley was over. Naval Party 8901 would be allowed to leave the island and upon returning home would all volunteer to join the hastily assembled Task Force South and take part in the liberation of the Falklands Islands. They would later re-raise the Union Jack in the grounds of Government House, a mere 10 weeks after the start of the initial invasion. Tuesday 15th of June, men who had been here when the Argentines invaded on April the 2nd and had defended Government House returned there that first morning of peace and raised the flag over the building they tried so hard to defend. The battle for Government House had lasted for just over three hours, facing overwhelming odds like Chard and Bromhead at Rourke's Drift in 1879 to the shrinking perimeter of Oosterbeek in 1944. Majors Norman and Newt should not be forgotten when we think of the tales of bravery and courage from the annuals of military history. Thanks for watching. Happy New Year, everybody. Please share and subscribe if you like this video. It really helps the channel grow and I hope to see you all again soon.